very time conscious, so that's why I need to ask the time. Yes, uh, what time do you finish? Half past. Half past eleven. Half past eleven. Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, okay. I'll try, I'll try to get in that. Well, good morning. Uh, allow me to greet you in the name of our great God and Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an honor indeed for me to be here, uh, just to be with you and uh, open the Word of God, learning from His Word. Before you can go there, let me also bring greetings as well from Christ Baptist Church and Christ Seminary where I serve and it's a joy as well for me to uh, be right here as much as we'll be talking about the conference but now let's focus on where we are. Um, I'm feel, I feel as well honored. <laughs> First time for, for me to be here, uh, not necessarily in the whole of Mamelodi, I've been to Mamelodi, but first time in this church. I've been longing really to, to come, and that's why when the invitation came, uh, I could not uh, resist. Uh, uh, in fact, I already made it in my mind that I'm not uh, intending to drive at night and go back yesterday. I would find a place somewhere. Um, my wife allowed me to do that in a way, uh, and I said. <laughs> but uh, when I was uh, asked if I'm available, I said, yes, I'd love to be with you so that we can open the Word of God together and learn uh, from the Word. The text of Scripture has been read already, but I'll read it again. I'll read it again. Um, I am really hoping that uh, I'll, give, I'll, I'll bring a word of encouragement and um, you will be educated. <clears throat> you will learn some things. And if need be, because it's beyond my power. It's beyond my ability to know what is happening in your heart. With that being said, that's where I trust the working power of the Holy Spirit. It was mentioned here, um, and even I think in the prayers, that you might be here as well this morning and you don't know the Lord. The prayer is that you don't leave this house, you don't leave this meeting without accepting Christ. You don't leave here with questions as the pastors and leaders are here to help you. Otherwise you'll get help from some other sources that you have no idea where they are also getting the information from. You are here to be helped, for sure. And I'll use this opportunity that God has granted you you didn't just come here, God brought you here. And for a purpose. And he knows that purpose. And he to fulfill that purpose. Let's get to Galatians chapter 3. That's where we'll spend our time. Uh, I'm reading from the NSB, uh, for in case you have a different translation. The, the Bible reads here. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you, do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Let me pray for the word. Father, this is your word. You gave it to us. 
We trust the Spirit of God who is able to interpret this to our minds and to let this word sink into our hearts. Therefore, we depend upon him. I also pray that you give me utterance to declare that which you have laid in my heart, that which I have prepared in your very presence. May the power of your word penetrate the hearts of the audience this morning, and may you accomplish your purposes that you have in your mind as you call each one of us to this house. We pray all of this because we trust in the power of the resurrected Lord, who is also our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me ask you uh, this question as we begin. Have you ever been lied to by somebody? (laughs) It's good that I'm not asking you if you have ever lied to someone. (laughs) How does it feel? To be lied to. And as a moral being, you don't want to be lied to. For sure. As much as you might lie to someone, but you don't want someone to lie to you. you that's, that, that's an evidence indeed that you are a moral being. You love the truth. And you want someone to speak the truth and tell you the truth. But one thing as well that you don't want to be lied to is about matters pertaining to your soul. You don't want anyone to lie to you about things that concerns your destiny. You read from the passages of scripture and if you go to the Old Testament, you will learn that the condition that we find ourselves in right now, today, is because of the first love. In Genesis chapter 3, the serpent had a conversation with Eve and he asked the question, did God really say that you shall not eat of all these fruits that he planted in this garden. The woman answered. She had no idea where the conversation is going. And uh, the devil said, you shall surely not die. You can eat this fruit. You shall surely not die. You know what God said? You shall surely die. The devil said, you shall surely not die. She bought the lie. She ate. Now we're here. Now we're here. Sin entered this world. Sin brought death. Death spread to all men. All men are dying now because all sin, the Bible says, was a lie. But here's the lie that I want to address. And I'll be in the book of Galatians. The other lie that we receive, and you might have received this one, you can be good enough to enter heaven. That's a lie. If you have ever heard that from somebody, that is a matter concerning your destiny, it's a matter concerning your soul. The Bible is very clear, very, very clear. In Romans 3, when you read that section from verses 9 and following, you learn something like, there is no one good, not even one, in the whole of this planet. Not even one person who is good, who is righteous. You can't find him. And even now, when we look at ourselves here, even today, even in this house, there's no one who is good. No one is righteous. Not even one. Now imagine you were lied to and said you can be good enough to enter heaven and then you are living that lie. You die and wake up in hell with a lie. 
that's what I really would love to address this issue and uh, I will be providing you with some facts from the book of Galatians that negates works in salvation. It negates works in justification. The key theme of the book of Galatians is justification, which is by faith alone. And we can use those words interchangeably. You have justification, you have salvation. They are used a lot interchangeably. And I can also use that as well interchangeably, even now. But that's the main theme of the book of Galatians. You are justified by faith alone, not by any works that you have done, that you have earned, that you have created, all of that will not save you at all. And that's what you need to understand. We're going to at least lay a bit of a background here that will serve as a foundation for us to understand because when we jump into sections like this, uh, it's a little bit confusing. Um, I read the text and you might be left with so many questions. More so, did you observe that in this verse, in this section is full of questions? Maybe you didn't see that. It's just question after question after question after question and you're adding more questions to the questions. And you're left with, I'm looking for answers. <laughs> and we need to try and bring some answers to some of these questions. But just to set a bit of a background for you to understand the book of Galatians, this is one of the first books because there's an argument between Thessalonic, uh, First Thessalonians and the book of Galatians in terms of which one did Paul write first. And now Galatians is also taken as uh, one competing in that particular realm. But the fact of the matter that we need to understand clearly is that Paul penned down this epistle after his first missionary trip. Paul was um, a missionary sent by the Holy Spirit together with Barnabas. They were members of the church of Antioch. Uh, that's you, what you read in Acts chapter 13. Now while they were praying, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them to do. The church was so obedient to the calling and the commission of the Holy Spirit, and they sent out Paul and Barnabas. And when they went out, they, they know for sure what their mission was. The mission was to preach the gospel. That was their mission. And they traveled all along to Asia, to, 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 to the Middle East. Most of the, they went to Antioch, Pisidia. They went to Lystra. They went to David, they went to Iconium, and they were preaching in those areas. Those areas are the territories that are found in the place called Galatia. Galatia is more like a province with so many other cities as well. Now they're preaching in those cities the gospel of Christ. Now, having said that, I think it would be good as well to make some few references if you can check with me right there in Acts chapter 13. Acts 13. Let me take your attention to verse 48. Verse 48 and 49. You will read the whole chapter on your own. The Bible reads here, When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region. As many as were appointed to eternal life, they believed. Go to chapter 14 and let me read verse 21. And then 23. After they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying through many tribulations 
we must enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And now the first missionary trip was done. Paul, as a faithful servant with Barnabas, they returned back to the sending church and they gave reports to what the Lord has done and how the Lord has used them in that particular ministry. And I want to get the clarity in terms of, as they were traveling to those regions, what is it that he preached? What was the gospel that Paul and Barnabas preached? Go back to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Let's pick up from verse 15 to 21, and then we'll set the context again in chapter 3 to get to understand the gospel they preach. Follow along. We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. But if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also found being sin sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor, for through the law I die to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. What is it that he preached in a summary form? Paul preached that a person is not justified by the works of the law. He preached that a person is justified by faith in Jesus Christ. He preached that a person should believe in Jesus in order to be justified. And he also preached emphasizing his point that by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. In one word, Paul preached justification. He preached justification. Justification is a declaration that the Father will make to those who believed in Christ that they are forgiven. And now they have a right standing with the Father. In fact, God the Father will declare them to be righteous and he will as well put into the account the righteousness of Christ. That's what justification is about. That's why justification is one of the doctrines that guarantees you heaven. Because the one who made a declaration will make a pronouncement for your life if you believe is the Father. And no one can change the Father's declaration. If the Father declares you to be righteous, no one can come and nullify that. That means the day you put your faith in Jesus and you said, I believe Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, he died for me on the cross and I recognize his work on the cross, I associate with that work, and I trust that he saved me from my sin and from the wrath of the almighty God, and I want to live a life that honors him. And God said, I declare that you deserve heaven, because I grant you a right standing. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are removed. Therefore, you can stand before God and say, based on the death of Jesus Christ, I can come to you. God said, yes, because you are, you are not righteous yourself. It is based on the righteousness of God that God imputed into your life and also accounted that into account. That's why you're not going to heaven based on your own righteousness. It's based 
on the righteousness of Christ. Amen. And that's the declaration God makes. And that's exactly what you want to know. And you want as well to get that assurance. I am justified by faith alone. The reformers will say that's where the, that's the hinge of the door. That's where the whole thing turned. In fact, the church is grounded on this doctrine. It's the doctrine upon which the church stands and upon which the church falls. Without it, you don't have a church. You don't have, without this, you don't have believers. Without this, you don't have any guarantee that indeed you will make it to heaven. But this is the key. And your ticket, a passport to heaven, justification. Go to chapter 3, verses 7 to 14. Therefore be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture for saying that God will justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. For the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. You know that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Again, it just sum up again the message, the gospel that Paul preached. You notice he continues with that gospel even in chapter 3. <coughs> Gentiles are justified by faith after hearing the gospel. And he added as well again in chapter 3 that no one is justified before God by the law. I find this fascinating because when you meet some people or professing Christians, you ask them the testimony of their salvation. They always insert something that they are not even aware of. But that's just a sign of their ignorance and a misunderstanding of the truth. How did you come to know the Lord? Are you really saved? Yes, I'm saved. How do you know that? I keep the law. I observe the laws. Oh, really? You are the only one who keeps the law. Are you making it? Are you fulfilling it? But you learn later on that that's just ignorance. And a clear sign that they are not really keeping the law at all. Because no one can keep the law. In fact, James put it this way. If you, let's, I think for argument's sake, I probably, you manage to keep nine of the law, the take law, the Ten command, nine. You manage. You break one. Guess what? You go back to zero. How can I keep nine and break one and then break all of them? That's what James says. But the point is proving that not one can keep the law perfectly. Then if you think you are saved by keeping the law, that means you are still not saved right now. The law was not given to save. The law was given to condemn and to reveal that you are a sinner. That's, that's the purpose of the law. So that when you learn that you are a sinner, then you will, you will need help. You will cry for help. But because you are claiming that you kept the law and you don't see your sinfulness, that's why you don't need Christ. But if you try to keep it, you will see the problem. And the problem is inside. The problem is in your heart. The problem is seen. And, and the remedy is outside you. And now you will need the remedy. How then do I get rid of this sin? 
Because every time I try to keep the law, I find myself falling short. And it should trouble your heart all the time. And say, I need help. And the only help you'll see is Christ. Because he kept the law perfectly. And that's why when you come to him, he is the one through his work that he accomplished to grant you that righteousness that you need. You cannot wait for it. You'll never get it. You are to receive it as a gift from the Lord. But that's the message, that's the gospel Paul preached. And now you know the gospel, you know a little bit of the background, but now let's dive in into the verses that we just read and find out from these verses. Uh, what is it that Paul is really teaching us? Like I've said, there are four facts. I'm not going to rush there. I will give those facts quickly. They will be easier for you to see them. But there's some things here in verse 1 that I'd rather need to deal with them. Verse 1. There are two major issues I need to deal with them. Because remember, I want to, again, bring those facts to negate works in justification. Get that clear. But go to verse 1. You notice in verse 1 the tone of the Apostle Paul. How he addressed these Galatians. I don't know what your Bible is saying, but the text before me right here says, You foolish Galatians. Sure. You really don't want that expression. But if it's coming from the Apostle, you will not compromise that. That's who you are. That's who you are. Galatians. Foolish. Strong, strong words. And he's raising this because you notice immediately by so saying, he already observed there's a problem. He's not just calling them foolish. There's a problem. And you sense that from the tone. And what was the problem? It's also a problem that you might also be facing. But let's then find out. Chapter 1, verse 6. Here's the problem. Paul said, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Mm. Which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. There are some who are disturbing you. And now you are thinking of departing, you're thinking of leaving. You are de thinking of departing from the Lord. You are thinking now of reverting back to your, own, to your lifestyle. Because they are presenting something that sounds like a gospel. Which is not a gospel, because there's only one gospel. It's the gospel of Christ. It's the gospel of grace. It's the gospel of justification. Then some people came... And now they are disturbing your mind. They are disturbing you. So that's why sometimes you need to be careful. As much as there are so many avenues wherein you can hear the gospel, you can go YouTube, you go Facebook, everywhere. You need to be discerning what you are hearing, what you are listening to. Because there are people who are right there who are aiming at disturbing some other people to deviate from the true gospel that you've heard. I believe the gospel has been preached here uh, and it's still being preached here, and it will be preached here as well. You know the gospel. But when someone comes and then you just put in something, right, and you start thinking, and you can, you can easily say, I think this guy is telling the truth. But what are we teaching here? Why are you easily persuaded to go to someone that you don't know? Hence, there are people you know here who are investing their time and even their energy to you by preaching the gospel. Then Paul had a concern. This Galatians want to deviate. He's calling them foolish or false. He used a very strong word as well, right in this. Because to be called a fool, or let me start with the word fool that he used here. It's a word that means unintelligent. Good enough, he didn't use another word which is translated fools or foolish. This one is unintelligent. You are unintelligent. That's a wise way of putting it. The other word that you could have used, a very strong word, is the word which is translated as stupid. He didn't use that word here. 
That word is used in some other passages as well. But when you are called a stupid, it got serious implications. <laughs> I don't want that. But what Paul is saying here, by being unintelligent, if I were to explain briefly, what Paul is saying, you are a fool and you are acting foolishly because a fool is somebody who is exposed to the truth. These Galatians were exposed to the truth. Acts 13 and 14, Paul preached the truth, the gospel. Now that they are exposed to the truth, they want to leave that which they know is truthful. And now want to embrace something that they don't know at all. That's what foolishness is. That's why we can call you a fool if you say you heard the gospel, but you will see you turning and accepting something that you know is not a gospel. That's foolish. That's unintelligent. That's what he's saying to the Galatians. Oh, foolish Galatians. Paul, you call them foolish? Yeah, I, I, I do. I do. That's exactly what you don't want to be. You don't want to hear the gospel, embrace the gospel, and turn away from the gospel. That's unintelligent. That's being foolish. Remember the account of the, 12, the 10 visions in Matthew 25? Five or what? Wise. Let's start with wise ones. What about the other five? And say it. <laughs> Unwise. Unwise. That, that's, a, that's a bad word. It's, it's, it's convicting, right? Just to call them faults. They know if we are going to wait for the bridegroom to come, we must have a spare kind of an oil. They know that. Because we're not told the time. The wise ones felt, you know, yes, yes, we need to be ready, but we have to have a spare. That's wise. The fools. Ah, uh, well, I, I think it will come just now. Uh, well, it will just come. Most will make a plan when we get there. That's, that's, that's unwise. That's unintelligent. When we, get there, when we sense that now it's about to come, we'll make a plan. That's foolish. They tried to make a plan when they heard the sound. And now the plan was, we'll go to these guys and say, well, man, give us something. The wise one said, no, 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 no. You know what? We'll also give you another wise kind of counsel. Go to the sellers out there. Oh, these guys were wise. Look at the foolish ones. They leave the territory, the place. They are rushing now to get the extra kind of oil. Coming back, the door is closed. Didn't they know? They knew. Foolishness. Foolishness. Paul is crying here and say, oh, foolish Galatians. You know the truth, now you want to depart from the truth to the gospel which is not even a gospel. But he didn't only say that. He added another statement right there, which I want to labor on that, and then we'll go to our facts. Very, very touching one, and uh, I'll have to apply this as well. Who, verse 1, has bewitched you? <laughs> Who has bewitched you? It doesn't look like what you're doing is normal. This is abnormal. You cannot leave the truth and go to something that is untruth. It's abnormal. <clears throat> you see, when, when, when you think of going back to your old lifestyle, that's abnormal. You were there before and you said you left that and now you embrace Christ, now you want to go back. That's abnormal. Something is wrong. Now he said, who bewitched you? These Galatians definitely were bewitched. It's more like an African. Right? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Paul has ever visited Africa and he knows these words, he knows the activities, he knows the practices as well. Yeah, I thought of jumping in yesterday when someone asked this question because it was asked in the conference. But what is Paul talking about? The word bewitch. It has got many meanings, but I'll focus on one. To bewitch means to malign, 
to cast under a spell. It is to slander, to pray about anyone, to bring evil on a person by feigned praise. That's also to pray, to, to, to bewitch. You know someone praising you, hence he knows deep down, that's not who you are. It covers, it's covered as well. To mislead by evil eye, to charm. It is simply to confuse, to mislead, to deceive. I like this next one, and I'll be using this as well, even though we'll focus on the figurative language that he used here, is to disturb the mind. Is to disturb the mind, um, causing insanity. You disturb the mind, causing insanity. Um, I don't know around here, but um, close to us, in our place, uh, in our town, um, you, you will find, and it's, it's, it's sad, it's really sad, you hardly will rejoice um, if you do have a soul. Um, you, you, you find men, and especially men, I hardly see women, uh, men carrying a luggage, a huge luggage, um, and uh, he's untidy, he's really unclean. And you can tell that maybe three or four months, even a year, and he never took a bath. And he's on a road, he's walking. And you wonder, where, where are you going? He's just walking. A huge, huge, huge bag of road is walking. You can, you can tell something's not right. Something's not right. The mind is disturbed. And you can try and stop and talk to him, it doesn't talk sense. The mind is disturbed. Now Paul is using that language here. But what he's trying to emphasize really is that to bewitch is to lead someone into evil doctrine. That's the idea of Galatians. Leading someone into evil or false doctrine is to bewitch someone. You see, the Galatians had the true gospel. And now there were some other people who were preaching another gospel of a different kind. And what were they doing? Bewitching the Galatians. Because they want to disturb their minds. They want to mislead them. They want to lead them to evil, sinful, false doctrines. Now we can ask as well, what is it that they were really preaching or teaching? Acts 15. Acts 15. I want to read the whole of that as well. Um, I'll read verse 1 and then rush to verse 5. This is what was taught. This is the bewitching doctrine. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised, According to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. That's a different gospel. This gospel says you are to be circumcised in order to be saved. If you are saying, yes, accepted Jesus, and you are not circumcised, your salvation is incomplete. In other words, if you accept Jesus and you don't perform some deeds to complete your salvation, you remain unsaved. That's the message. That's a different gospel. Paul never preached that. If you hear Christ plus, if you hear the gospel plus, if you hear Christianity plus, that's a different gospel. It's not a gospel of grace. It's not a gospel of Christ. It's not a gospel that saves. It's a different gospel. It's of another kind. Look at verse 5. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. Did you notice one word there? Necessary. They are stressing that they, this must be done. That's not a gospel. This is what the Judaizers, this is what the sect of the Pharisees taught. My concern with this is that they are not coming from outside. They were inside. 
See, that's why if you don't embrace the true gospel, you are as well an instrument that the enemy can use to disturb the minds of those who had the gospel, even in this church. You have to know the gospel. So that whenever you are as well sharing or preaching to someone else, you don't disturb the mind of a believer. Because you'll be bewitching that person, leading them to a false doctrine which is not a gospel at all. Know the gospel. Embrace the truth. A person is not justified by works, but by faith in Christ Jesus alone. Here are a few things in application. Very challenging and uh, convicting. You are bewitched if you believe that your salvation is incomplete. You're already bewitched. But let me then give you the specifics. And you'll be checking yourself. You'll be checking your heart and you're checking as well your lifestyle. And checking as well what you have embraced up until now. There's a positive in this, but if you had the negative on this, you know for sure that you are bewitched. You are bewitched if you believe that the following are necessary for salvation. The following are necessary for your justification. Unless you are baptized in water or spirit, you cannot be saved. Baptism is important. But if you believe you can only be saved by being baptized, you're bewitched. Because you're reversing the order. You're putting baptism before salvation. We believe in believer's baptism. You must believe and then be baptized. You don't get baptized and then believe later. You are bewitched. We have to repel that. We have to reverse that. And only the gospel of Christ that you need to hear will change that. You are bewitched if you believe this as well. Unless you read your Bible regularly, you will not get to heaven. You need to read the Bible, don't you? All believers must read the Bible. But you don't read the Bible to get to heaven. Reading the Bible don't get you to heaven. You must be saved. You must receive Christ and be justified by faith alone. Then you read your Bible continually, not working to heaven. If you start working your way to heaven, you lost it, you are bewitched somewhere. There is no amount of work that you can ever perform for you to earn heaven. You are bewitched if you also believe the following. Unless you attend the church regularly, you will not get to heaven. Church attendance is a must for all believers. All justified people must attend the church, but they're not coming to church in order to go to heaven. If that's you, you're thinking by coming to church, you find a way to get to heaven, you're bewitched. <laughs> there are so many big churches that we know, and those people are not going to heaven. How do we know that? How can we say that? Because they're not justified by faith. They have not received the gospel of grace. Can I add more? Yes, sir. <laughs> you now know it. You hear this a lot when you go out to evangelize and you tell some people, unless you stop drinking and smoking, you'll not be saved. No, you don't need to be a better person first. Unless you stop drinking and smoking, People said, sort your house first. That's the language they use. Sort your house first, then you can come to Christ. You are bewitched. <laughs> don't, don't engage in bewitching people. Mm. Give them the gospel. Give them the gospel. Unless you give a certain amount of money or goods to the needy, you will not be accepted by God. So that's why so many people are involved in charity so that they can earn what? Heaven. Bewitched. The gift of givers are doing so much, but no gospel. 
None. Unless you stop eating certain food and put certain type of clothes, you won't get heaven. So your uniform will not pave a way to get heaven. No, I don't eat pork. Oh, I'm holy. You're not holy by not eating pork. That will not get you to heaven. That's how people are bewitched. And still sitting in the church and they are thinking, I'm heading to heaven. You're not heading to heaven. It's a different path. Lastly, unless you partake in the communion, you eat the bread and you drink the cup, and you, 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 you might observe this as well in some other uh, denominations. And it said it to me as well, but there's nothing I can do. and There's nothing you can do as well. You will find in a funeral service, people serving communion. What is their mind? What are they thinking? Oh, we are paving the way for this person who will make it to heaven because he didn't get the last supper. Oh. Does communion pave a way related to heaven if this person never believed? And now, because we are offering the communion, God will accept that person. Bewitched. <laughs> Cannot make it to heaven. That's what Paul is saying. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has bewitched you? Do we need to, I think we need to negate this. Let me give you four facts quickly from the text here. That negates works in justification. What simply means is these facts will help you understand that there are no amount of works that you can ever perform to be justified by God. What you need is the gospel. And the gospel will come out very clearly in verse 1. What's the first fact? Like I said quickly, the gospel is enough. Verse 1. If the gospel is enough, you must hear the gospel clearly preached. You must hear the gospel clearly preached. You can read it, that's fine. But you must hear the gospel clearly. Look at verse 1. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as what? As crucified. What is that? That's the gospel. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of what? Of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of that. It's the power of God for salvation. And he said in Corinthians, I'm determined to preach nothing but Christ crucified. That's Paul. He mentioned that the gospel or the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. For us, it's the power of God. Christ crucified. That's the gospel. Check with me in chapter 1, verse 4. That's the gospel there. Paul is sending a greetings. He said, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. That's the gospel. The gospel is enough. What you need to hear is that Jesus gave himself for us. The best way to understand that is not just for us, in the place of sins. That's what he did. Christ placed himself in our place and dying in our place. That's the gospel. Did you notice that he didn't just do that? There was a purpose for that. To deliver, to deliver, to save. He's saving us from this present evil age. Because he wants to deliver us to the kingdom of his beloved. He wants to deliver us to a place that is preparing. That's the gospel you are to hear. It's enough to save you. It is enough to justify you by faith if you receive it. That's enough. That's what Paul is called. It's a fact. It's a fact. Know the gospel. This is a second fact right there in verses 2, verses 3, verses 5. What is it? The Holy Spirit is enough. 
If the Holy Spirit is enough, you receive the Holy Spirit at conversion. Look at the verses there. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Did you receive the Holy Spirit? Was it by the works of the law or was it by hearing and trusting? The answer is obvious. It's by hearing. Hearing what? It's a question. The gospel. That means you receive the Holy Spirit at the moment of your conversion. When you hear the gospel and respond to the gospel by faith and repentance, at that moment, you are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Because it is the Holy Spirit who regenerates. It is the Holy Spirit who changes a dead soul and gives life eternal at that moment. Get saved. Before you attend church, before you get baptized, at that moment, the rest will fall. That's the gospel Paul preached. And this is the gospel we're preaching as well. Look at verse 3. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? The Holy Spirit is enough. You begin your Christian journey with the Holy Spirit, and you also come to completion through the work of the Holy Spirit. That means your whole journey of sanctification is the Holy Spirit. The glorification, which we call perfect sanctification, is the work of the Holy Spirit. Your whole journey. That's why it's enough. You get the gospel right, and then you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, you will be guided by Him up until you reach your destiny, which is heaven. It's enough. You don't need more. You don't need more. And that, that's the joy of the gospel. It's the beauty of the gospel. That's why you need to love the gospel and embrace the gospel and realize that this journey is really clear and I will make it. Not in my own strength, but because of his ability to do that. Look at verse 5. So then does he who provides you with the spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Again, this one who provides the Holy Spirit, God provided that and he worked wonders. The first wonder that is of utmost importance is the change of your soul. Do you know that salvation regenerates the miracle worked by God? Before you think of all other miracles around, the first miracle you should experience and enjoy is the change of your soul. Just to know that you are changed, you are quickened, you are given life eternal, you are a new creation. It's a miracle. It's wrought by the Holy Spirit. It's enough. That's what you need. Thirdly, there's another fact here. We pick that up from verses 2 and 5. The last portion of verses 2 and 5. If you observe with me, verse 3, chapter 3, verse 2, the last section ends right there, by hearing with faith. Chapter 3, verse 5, the last part, by hearing with faith. What's the third part? Saving faith is enough. Saving faith is enough. Oh, there are different kinds of faith, yes. There are demonic faith. There is dead faith. So demonic faith is what James mentioned, that demons believed and they shudder. They know God is there, but they don't act about it. They have nothing to do about it. It's a demonic faith. A dead faith is a faith that produces no works. Oh, I believe in Jesus. Let's see the proof, evidence. No evidence. It's a dead faith. That's what you need is a living faith. A saving faith. That saving faith alone is enough for you. You must then believe. You must then believe. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 is very, very clear as well. Let's read that. Let's read that. Romans 10 verse 13. No, verse 17, sorry. So faith comes from hearing. And hearing by the word of Christ. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of Christ. That means faith is a gift. You cannot generate it by works. You cannot buy it somewhere. Someone cannot just tell you that yes, you have faith. You must receive it from the Lord. 
And when you receive it, it's yours. It's personalized. You see, salvation is a personal thing. And it is internal. It's not an external thing. It's internal, and it must flow from inside out. Then people are to see that you are indeed changed from inside. That's why if you try by covering yourself with works to prove that you are a good person, hence your heart is totally depraved. You're just faking Christianity. And you're lying to the people as well. You need a saving faith, which is a gift from the Lord. How do you get that? The Bible says here, it comes by hearing. What are you to hear? The gospel. The gospel. And when you receive it, it's enough. You don't need to add anything to your saving faith. You just need now to live and walk by faith. Lastly, lastly, this is the last, the fourth fact. The gospel is enough. The Holy Spirit is enough. Saving faith is enough. Now, verse 6 reveals to us that Abraham is enough. Abraham is enough. Abraham is the best example of justification by faith. What more do you need? What best example do you need in the whole scripture? Abraham is the one. Abraham is the one. Look at verse 6. Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. We love Abraham, don't we? We teach our kids uh, the song, Father Abraham. He has many sons. He has many sons. Are you one of them? Are you one of them? Because if he has many sons, the text before us in the context reveals that as well. That we are sons of Abraham by faith. If you, are, if, if you believe, you are a son of Abraham by faith. It's not a physical thing. It's not a natural thing. It's a spiritual thing. There's many sons. And it's the best example. Let me illustrate this as well more in terms of Abraham. For so that's how we're going to get to the conclusion here. We already exceeded the time. When you think of the call of Abraham, Abraham was not different from us. By the way, Abraham was not a Jew. Abraham was not an Israelite. Abraham was a Gentile. God called him. And when God called him, he was worshipping celestial beings. He worshipped moons and stars. That's how Abraham grew up. That means he was an idolater. Worshipping created things. But God called him. And when God called him, Abraham responded by faith. Read Hebrews 11. By faith, Abraham lived his country, going to a place where he did not know. By faith. He trusted God. God will never mislead me. Wherever he's calling me, I will go there. And then as he obeyed God in that regard, you find God making a covenant with Abraham. That's Genesis 15. And Abraham believed the promises of God. Because God promised him that he will bear a son. And God was thinking far beyond that. And indeed, he blessed Abraham with a son. But before the blessing, Abraham believed. That's where this passage we read in verse 6. It's related to Genesis 15 verse 6 as well. Where Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He was declared by God to be a righteous man at that point. That's Abraham. How did he do that? By faith. Did Abraham hear the gospel? Do you think he did? If justification is by faith, and faith comes by hearing, did he hear the gospel? You may tend to think no. Look at verse 8. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. What did he do? What did God do? Preach the good news. Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham. God himself did that because justification is by the gospel. You have to believe. You have to put faith. God did that to Abraham. Just imagine God himself preaching to Abraham. Abraham believed and was justified. He's the best example. He's enough. You don't need to add many other examples. We can do that. But Abraham, man, is the best example that we can associate with. We know our past. We know where we're coming from. We know what we're doing. 
And when God extends the gospel to us and you receive it, so now, that's exactly the same thing with Abraham. Justified by faith. And one more thing with Abraham, which we have to appreciate. He did not just receive the gift of faith. He lived that out. Genesis 22, when God asked Abraham, in fact, he tested him. And he said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, for in case you don't know what I'm referring to, Isaac, and take him to Moriah and make him a bent offering. What that means, if you make something a bent offering, the only thing you can take back home is ashes. Go make him ashes. Uh, good enough, we'll leave the rest. He, he didn't tell his, his wife, I don't think so. <laughs> yes. Sarah, I'm going to make a sacrifice. No, 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 she, she's going to hold this. I don't know, it's not going to happen. <laughs> but what's the point? The point is, Abraham obeyed God. And if you notice, that's where people struggle. And that's where the lie comes in. His obedience was a proof of the genuineness of his faith. That means the work of Abraham of offering Isaac on the altar to sacrifice him justified that Abraham is indeed genuinely saved. It, is. it was not the reverse. Yeah. The work of Abraham did not save him. Yeah. But the work justified that Abraham is a saved person. So that's why when you are justified by God, we need to see that by your actions. You have to leave that out. Abraham was living his faith. And he has grown up to a point wherein he can say, I can even offer my son to God. Hebrews tells us that he believed that God is able to raise him from the dead. That's why he tells the servants, wait here, we're just going to worship, I and my son will come back. He believed that. God is able. I can kill him and God is able to raise him. I'll go back with my son. And that was a picture of Christ, isn't it? A beautiful picture of Christ dying in a place. In conclusion, in conclusion, the argument of Paul is clear. And then you're also clear up until this time. The Apostle Paul is proving to us that justification, it is only by faith in Christ Jesus alone. And what you need is the gospel of grace, the gospel of Christ. Christ who died in your place for your sins. And he rose from the dead. And he lives right now. And he's in the business of saving dead people, sinners. When they embrace him by faith alone, they are justified by God. They are forgiven. They are given a right standing before God. They are accounted to be righteous. And they are guaranteed heaven. That's all you need. Then when you have done that, that's when you will also follow those instructions, injunctions that he gave you. You get baptized. You get to find a good church. A Bible teaching church. And then engage as well in the ordinances of church. The communion, the prayer, the reading of scripture, the fellowship with other saints. Then you engage on that and you do that regularly and consistently and faithfully. Yes. Because you know you're already accepted by God. And now you need to meet with other, be other believers who are on the same road heading to the place that God has prepared. But while we are waiting, then we are engaging in this activity of worshipping the Lord together, encouraging one another, edifying one another. That's why God left us here. He didn't just save us and take us to heaven. He left us and said, be here. Oh, now we can tell others about justification as well. You need to be justified. How? You explain the gospel. And we bring more and more and more into the kingdom as God will use us. That's the message that I wanted to encourage you. And I'm hoping as well, like we, 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 we your pastor already uh, suggested that we might have some uh, time, maybe with Queen A, we'll do that. We'll do that if there is time. Because there's so much as well that we can still learn out of this passage. And also from what you have in mind. I do have a lot as well to address, but I think you remember these four facts. The gospel is enough. Believe it. The Holy Spirit is enough. You receive him by faith alone. Saving faith is enough. You don't need anything to add. Abraham is your best example. Is enough. Okay.